I know it's a little bit colder than we would have liked, but here's the thing. If you chant louder, you will feel less cold. I 100% believe that there are scientific studies that back this up. So you just gotta take my word for it. Chanting makes you warmer. No coup, no war, no sanctions anymore. 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 No coup, no war. No coup, no war. Not for war. Money for housing. Not for war. Money for housing. Not for 
for war. Money for housing. Not for war. Money for housing. Not for war. Money for housing. Not for war. Money for education. 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 Not for war. Money for daycare. 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 Not for war. Money for trans care. 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 Not for war. If you got here and you don't have a sign, we've got signs over here. They keep flying away. So if you came and picked one up to hold, then that would mean that there would be less that could fly away. Kill two birds with one stone, not violently, right there, okay? And remember, feel free to jog in place, to stay warm, or go stand in the sun. My name is Meredith, and I'm going to be co I'm seeing here with Simon, and Simon, I'm, I'm going to let Simon say some introductory remarks, and then we're going to get this show on the road. Welcome, Simon. Woo! <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. How are we feeling? Yeah! Uh, my name is Simon. I'm an organizer at the Party for Socialism and Liberation. We're here today in response to a call uh, for action from the Answer Coalition on the 20th anniversary of the illegal and brutal invasion, United States invasion of Iraq. And we're marking the anniversary of one war by also discussing a current war, and that is the U.S.-NATO proxy war in Ukraine. Right now in Washington, D.C., there are thousands of people representing hundreds of organizations demonstrating outside the White House, demanding an end to U.S. funding of that war, to demand that NATO be abolished, and that the hundreds of billions of dollars that be, are being sent for uh, war abroad be spent on human needs here in the United States, such as food, housing, education, and health care. Yeah. Today here in Minneapolis, you're going to hear from a variety of speakers, including union leaders from the MFT. You're going to hear from activists with Black Lives uh, Matter Minnesota. You're going to hear from veterans with Veterans for Peace and Movement for, Pe uh, Movement for People's Democracy. You're also going to hear from a member of the Anti-War Committee who recently returned from Venezuela. It is a scary reality, but it's becoming more and more clear that the warmongers in D.C. Uh, have their eyes not just at a proxy war in Ukraine, but are looking at a bigger target, a bigger conflict, and that is eventually war with China. They're scared, boo, they are scared of the rise of a multipolar world, and they're scared of the ascendancy of a socialist China. Thus, we are here to commemorate and to remember a past war and the millions of lives that were lost in the war of, in Iraq. We're here to protest again against a present war in Ukraine, and we're here to prevent a future war uh, in China, or against China. So with that, thank you all again for coming. Thank you all for braving the cold, and I'm going to pass it back to Meredith. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. As Simon said, my name is Meredith. I'm a member of the Anti-War Committee and a member of Freedom Road. And my pleasure is to introduce our first speaker, Sammy Rasuli. Many of us have been touched firsthand by the stories that Sammy has told us of the situation in Iraq. We first started organizing with Sammy when he was living in the United States, here in Minneapolis. He owned a restaurant that had the best falafel in the city. Best falafel. And, but he eventually went back to Iraq because he wanted to rebuild our, his country from what our country had done to it. Over 4,700 U.S. and NATO soldiers died. Over 100,000 Iraqis died. At least. That's a conservative number. Iraq started as a country that was unified and had a stable government and one of the highest rates of education for women in the entire Middle East. 
None of that is true anymore. We've left Iraq in, in, in a travesty with ethnic tensions that we sparked, with devastation that we caused, with depleted uranium that we left all over the country. And we did it all under the auspices of weapons of mass destruction, which our government lied to us about. So we have much to learn from the struggle in Iraq, because when people tell us that we should go to war, you should 100% say no. And if you need an example or a case study, you use this war. Because we, these lives, they should still be with us. So please welcome Sammy Rasuli, Lifetime Minnesotan and Iraqi. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, everyone. And good morning, my friends. Good afternoon. Good evening, all about. Anyway, Tim Kane, Democrat from Virginia and his colleague, the Republican, uh, Todd, I believe Todd Young, is a Republican from Indiana. They suddenly, with others in the Senate, they woke up after two decades of destroying Iraq, the country that is crippled now and nowhere to go with lots of economical, social, and political problem since the U.S. invaded Iraq under the leadership of George W. Bush, who assigned a puppet government. So those two senates two days ago introduced a bill to repel so-called the AUMF, which is Authorization of Military Forces in Iraq. There are two resolutions they were issued in 1991 and 2002 after first invading Kuwait by the Iraqis and the second when George Bush W. Uh, invaded Iraq. So they all of a sudden recognized after two decades of destroying Iraq that they don't need those two resolutions because they have already uh, a yes yes government, uh, uh, a puppet government. So they don't need that resolution. And I am here to tell you I'm a little bit uh, uh, relieved by this and it need to be passed also by the House next week, sometime next week. So bullying Iraq will be over but still our kids are bullied in the school. The education system is so failing in the United States, the only country in the world we have the school mass shooting. School mass shooting should be addressed because our future is destroyed by the false policies of our government officials who leave those kids unoriented, misguided, telling them the war in Ukraine is no, no, but occupying Palestine is yes, yes. How could our kids understand this misguided education? So, killing human beings, human beings' lives became worthless as the, our kids understand. And that's for, that's, that's why we have like a population of 336 million people, but those millions have 390 million weapon pieces available to go out and kill. So making money for the companies who make those weapons, whether those weapons are small, you can buy from any store that in town or huge weapon that the Biden administration is providing the Ukrainian to continue their war in Ukraine. Continuing the war in Ukraine means as a result maybe World War III. 
and that's a disaster's income, uh, outcome will be. So education needs to be changed in this country. And also the uh, government, the government that is leading us stop bullying other countries so our kids don't learn from our government to bully their classmates in the school. Thank you so much. From Iraq to Palestine, occupation is a crime. 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 Thank you, Meredith. And thank you again, Sammy. Can we give a round of applause again, please? Thank you. I just want to take a moment to recognize how beautiful it is that we're stretching from all the way over there down to the end on the corner, and how many people are here braving the cold weather to stand and say no to war on Russia, no to war on China, and that we need to invest not in war, but in human needs. Yeah. Next up, I'd like to introduce our speaker with Veterans for Peace. He's a veteran of the invasion of Iraq, Joshua Ferris. Yeah, hello, I'm Joshua Ferris. I'm a, an Iraq veteran against the wars. Uh, I, was, I fought in one of the good wars. Yeah, just like the war in Vietnam was one of the good wars. I'm also a member of Vets for Peace. A lot of veterans here who fought in the good war. Vietnam, there was a good war. Uh, like Afghanistan, that was a just and good war. And like every goddamn war we fought for the last hundred years, it was the good war. Just like this one, it's the good war. This is the war that we're supposed to support. Forget about the last war. The last war, all the crimes and the lies and all the death and destruction and the waste. This is the good war we have to support. It's bullshit, it's nonsense. Uh, Putin is, uh, Putin is uh, you know, he's a bogeyman. He's a great bogeyman. They got us ready for this. Remember, Trump was the Manchurian candidate. Uh, tra you know, uh, uh, Putin had his uh, strings. He was pulling his strings. We had to be afraid of Russia. Got to be afraid of Russia. And now we're at war with Russia. How come they increased the Pentagon's budget by another fifty hundred billion dollars when we pulled out of Afghanistan? Oh, by the way, we're still occupying a third of Syria. That's where the oil is. Uh, Iraq is still devastated. They need uh, reparations for the destruction and the waste. We invaded it for no reason. Oh, Saddam Hussein, though, he was a big, he was a bad guy. He was a monster. You know, he was our buddy in the 80s when he was doing our dirty work fighting Iran for us. Putin was our buddy. He was our buddy. He was going to lead uh, Russia down the right path, have a McDonald's on every corner. Oh, but now McDonald's is pulled out. We're doing sanctions on Russia. Russia, you know, they're controlled by the great bogeyman. You got your poor Russia. Well, you know, they just overthrown. You know what? Russia is growing. You don't grow an economy during war. You do not grow an economy. They're doing great. They, China, this is good news, everybody, good news. China just negotiated peace between Iran yeah! and Saudi Arabia. They've been waging a proxy war in Yemen for years. All sorts, oh my God, what a human rights uh, disaster. Just a crisis beyond imagining. And China negotiated peace. Yeah! Woo! Yeah. Why couldn't the United States call for peace? Why couldn't we call for peace? All we could do is send weapons over there. And what about what about this new war in Ukraine? There was peace. There was a peace agreement before this. Then they were going to have another. They were going to peace talks last spring. And Boris, whatever, some some NATO puppet went over there and said, "No, do not negotiate with Russia." They think they're telling us that Ukraine's going to win this war. We got to just keep sending arms, keep sending bullets and guns and bombs, and they'll win. Nobody's going to win this war. Everyone is going to lose if we keep going down this primrose path. 
Russia doing so bad. Russia doing so bad. They just finished a subway around a brand new, modern, clean subway around Moscow. Russians have universal health care. We couldn't get health care during the middle of a pandemic. We have always more money for war. You know, Medicare for all would actually save us money. But we don't have money for that. We got money for war. All this, all this, all this waste, all this destruction, it is pointless, it is all, it's all for bloody war pigs, and they want to have more money, and they don't even care if we start firing nukes at each other. They don't care about us. They don't give a damn about you. They don't care if we go to World War III. They want to, they don't care. They do not care if we have homeless sleeping under every bridge. They don't care if our bridges collapse on those homeless. They don't care if the people that don't have a living wage driving to work stuck in traffic are on that bridge while it collapses. And they don't care if we're suffering from medical debts. They don't care if we can't afford the rent. They don't care if we got millions in prison. They don't care. They want more money. They want they want to get those bombs over there. They want it. They don't care. 300,000 Ukrainians are dead. They don't care. More people in Ukraine have now been killed than all the Americans. They didn't die in World War II during Europe. I looked at the map. By the end of this year, there will be more dead Ukrainians than all the U.S. soldiers that died in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam combined. Russia is using 15 to 20,000 artillery rounds a day. Their factories are turning out 500,000 artillery rounds a month. They're feeding those guns. And you have psychopaths, people like Senator Lindsey Graham, that say, we'll fight this war with Russia to the last Ukrainian. We want it to end? Here's what we do. We go to the people who are voting for war and we say no more. What, you want me to die for money? Why don't you give us health care? Why don't you give us education? Why don't you give fix our roads and our bridges? Why don't you, I don't want you to spend any more money on this war. You tell Ilhan Omar, you tell Senator Klobuchar, you tell all of them that are voting for war, we don't want one more dollar to go to war! That's what you do, you occupy their offices. We did this before during, during the Iraq war, we gotta do it during this war, we gotta tell those politicians, not one more dollar for war! That's what we do! That's how we stop the war! So I, and now they want us not to work together, they don't want us not to work with libertarians, they want us not to work with these people or that people, we can only work with these people. Well you know what? That's divide and control. They won't want most of Americans to get together and say, we want that money spent on the people, we don't want any more war. They don't want that. So you work with anyone who wants to end this war and you focus on that. That's how politics works. Let's do this. Let's end the war. My favorite Vets for Peace chant. Hey NATO, you're done. Your mission ended in 91. Hey NATO, you're done. Your mission ended in 91. Hey NATO, you're done. Your mission ended in 91. Thank you, Veterans for Peace. As Josh was just talking about, we need to spend this money at home to take care of human needs. And our next speaker knows that all too well. Please welcome Natasha Docker. Doctor, she is a member of Minneapolis Federation of Teachers. Woo! Woo! And she's going to, not only was she on strike this time last year, but she is here to talk about money for human needs, like education and children and not war. Please welcome Natasha. Woo! Hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Doctor, and I am a proud educator and member of the Minneapolis Federation of Educators. A year ago, I was on strike with 4,000 other educators across the city. We were on strike because our students lack the resources and supports they deserve. They lack these resources because as a society, the corporate elites and bosses had decided that spending on war is more important than teaching our children how to read. Well, we won a lot while we were on strike, we did not win enough. 
We continue to fight for additional spending on education, such as fully funding our special education needs and making sure that all children have access to food during school. Instead of continuing to spend money on war and the CIA, as educators, we stand with you and we are proud to be here to stand up to ensure that we spend money on the resources that our students and our children deserve and not on war. Thank you. Money for schools, not for war. 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 Teachers, not for war. Thank you again, Natasha. Our next speaker is gonna talk a little bit about another conflict that the warmongers in DC are trying to pull us towards. Nick Anderson with the Movement for People's Democracy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nick Anderson and I am with the Movement for People's Democracy. So, there was a general recently who said, by 2025, we'll be ready to go to war with China. And I say hell no for that. We hear a lot of talk in the mainstream Western media about human rights abuses in China by such paragons of human rights, such as Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, no less. What are these human rights violations they claim? They throw out words like Xinjiang and forced labor. What they will not tell you is that the representatives from over 30 Muslim countries, including experts from the UN and international human rights groups, have visited Xinjiang and have concluded that there is no genocide going on in there. In fact, in February of 2021, the U.S. State Department even admitted there was insufficient evidence to support the claim of the genocide narrative. What is China's real crime to them? They brought their people out of poverty through its investments and infrastructure like the Belt and Road Initiative. In 2022, China had stated it had eradicated extreme poverty within its borders, lifting 80 million people out of poverty. Unemployment is below 3%, and poverty has been dropping both in Xinjiang and China itself. In Tibet, Tibetan is taught in schools at all levels and 94% of Tibetans can speak, read, and write their language. Can we say the same about our First Nation brothers who have been forced onto reservations and live in the most dire of poverty and circumstances? How can we, much of our country is being invested in? The U.S. has no moral authority to criticize China or any country about human rights abuses when it has its own detention centers on the borders where people are getting sick and dying. Guantanamo Bay is still open. Let's also not forget that the U.S. has more people in jail per capita than the rest of the world. 68% of those are Hispanic and black, and they account for only 33% of the population. Never mind our prison system is largely privatized, and it is heavily invested by all those billionaires, you could call them oligarchs or whatever you want, that are profiting off the misery of people in this carceral system. China, according to our rulers and the enlightened people, or is an existential, is an existential threat to us? Excuse me. What exactly is this existential threat to us? And to who exactly? Is it to we the people who are squeezed and nickeled and dimed out of every single cent for everything in our lives? Or is it those moneyed interests, those bloodthirsty ghouls in the military industrial complex and finances? China, they say, is out to dominate the world. But China is not the country that has hundreds of military bases abroad. It does not have a military budget that is the same size as the next eight countries combined. And it is also not the country that is encouraging right-wing religious extremists to perform terror attacks and radicalize people. China recently had its hand in the nominalization of diplomatic ties between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And there's even talk that this could bring about the wind to that war and genocide in Yemen. What has the U.S. done? 
America has spent 2.2 trillion over the last two decades in Afghanistan alone. 2.2 trillion. What could we have done with that? You know what China did with 2.2 trillion over the last two decades? They modernized all their cities. They built the so-called ghost cities the media had declared about that were going broke from a high-speed rail system that are now, those cities are filled and that high-speed rail network is the largest and most efficiently run in the entire world. What have we done with 2.2 trillion here? Jackson, Mississippi could have clean water and its waste industrial plants all fixed up for only 80 mil 800 million. Flint, Michigan could easily have clean water and new pipes for under a billion. Yet again, what have we done here? Ukraine gets 100 millions for weapons and other tools of death. Only 30% of those actually reach the front line, the rest of them going to extremists and who knows else in the black market. What? There's 100 billion for Ukraine, but for us here and in East Palestine recently, absolutely nothing. The hegemony of the U.S. empire is waning. China's economy is growing and is en route to surpass ours within a few short years. Our oligarchs know this and they are fighting tooth and nail to preserve their dying influence. And they are desperate to preserve it no matter what or who has to die for it. It's not going to be them and their children that are going to bear the cost of all of this. It's going to be us. What better world could we build with cooperation with China? We could actually transition to renewable energy, work on serious global disarmament efforts, and even tackle the looming climate crisis in a serious way. But instead, the ruling oligarchs and the military industrial complex go strutting around the world and inciting provocations in a desperate bid to keep U.S. imperial hegemony and the unipolar world, which they feel that we are, they are entitled to. And I have to say to that, no war with China! Disband NATO now! No war with China! Disband NATO now! No war with China! Disband NATO now! Thank you. Thank you very much. When China is under attack, what do we This is works. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. USA, shame on you. No more sanctions, no more coups. Coups and sanctions cost lives. We don't believe the media's lies. Sanctions cost lives. We don't believe the media lies. Coups and sanctions cost lives. We don't believe the media lies. We won't sit back for another attack. We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when you ruined the rap. We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when you ruined your act. We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when you ruined your act. We were here when you ruined your act. We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when you ruined your act. We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when you ruined your act. Our last speaker is Andrew. Many of you know Andrew because he's been a longtime member of the Minnesota Peace Action Coalition. But we recently sent him somewhere where it wasn't as cold. We sent him to Venezuela with the message of solidarity for Minnesota. Venezuela is one of many countries that the U.S. has sanctions on. And repeatedly we are sold these sanctions and told that these are humanitarian ways peaceful ways of disagreeing with other countries and that is bullshit sanctions kill people and andrew got to see firsthand the impacts of that please welcome andrew from the anti-war committee hey everyone <clears throat> as meredith just said i'm here to talk about sanctions on venezuela because me and another member of the anti-war committee drake uh just came back from venezuela a week ago 
But before I talk about that, since we're here to mark the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq, I just want to remind people that before the U.S. invaded that country, it softened it up with sanctions. The people of Iraq were prevented from uh, accessing medicine, food, electricity, even clean drinking water since 1990. Uh, and by the time the U.S. invaded, it was already crushing that country, killing hundreds of thousands of people, many of them, if not most of them, children, for more than a decade. And today, the U.S. is trying to do to Venezuela what it did to Iraq. And for similar reasons, Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. And that should explain absolutely everything to those of us who lived through the Bush era. <clears throat> and although the war on Venezuela doesn't involve guns or bombs, at least not yet, it, it's not any less deadly. In one year alone, uh, 40,000 people were killed by U.S. sanctions. And that was actually before the pandemic when things got worse. Just about everyone that we met in Venezuela has at least one horror story about what they went through under sanctions. Uh, we met people who were unable to get medicine and who lost children and loved ones as a result. The hospitals didn't even have electricity half the time. One woman told us about watching children line up to breathe on a ventilator, to take turns fucking breathing in the hospital. And that's, that's what sanctions look like. That's what hybrid war looks like. Hybrid war is about breaking the spirit of the people. And we heard that over and over from people. So many people turned to us and said, they are trying to break our spirit here. <clears throat> And I can guarantee you that if you turn on the TV in this country and see a story about Venezuela, it's going to be about how there's no political freedom in the country, there's no freedom of speech, there's a dictatorship, and so on and so on. But I can tell you that does not line up with what Drake and I saw there. People are perfectly free to criticize the government, to protest in the streets. The political system is extremely committed to democracy. Actually, I couldn't, to be honest with you, I couldn't keep track of how many political parties there are there um, because the system is so complex because of how democratic it is. <clears throat> and, and these are parties that are in power. They're not bullshit third parties like we have in the US that can't do anything. <clears throat> If you turn on the, the TV there, you get, a lot of times the first thing you see is anti-government U.S. media. The idea there's no freedom of speech in the country is absolute bullshit. But <clears throat> more than that, we saw real democratic programs in the economic realm that absolutely outstrip anything that I've ever seen in the United States. And those programs are in fact what has allowed Venezuela to make it through the worst of the sanctions and to improve things over the years. And there's a lot I could talk about. I could talk about the massive public housing projects we saw, both built and more under construction. I could talk about the free medical clinics we saw. I could talk about the subsidy programs that help Venezuelans get by and survive the sanctions, but what struck me most was agricultural development. You can do this. I, hold on. Woo! <laughs> Come on, fingers. You got it, brother. <laughs> it's cold out. My fingers aren't working. <laughs> Uh, Venezuela is actually blessed with one of the most um, uh, fortunate and productive agricultural climates in the world. Their soil is very fertile. They can grow crops there 10 months out of the year. But back, because of uh, how the oil companies used to run everything before Chavez and then Maduro took over, uh, all of the money that came from the oil went out of the country to import food or to line the pockets of oil executives. And nothing was left to invest in the country or to invest in agriculture. But now things are very different. We met with a feminist farmers organization, the Mujeres Conoqueras, who have taken unused agricultural land and developed it and run it themselves with the support of the government. And in the commune where we met that organization, they grow, they pick, pack, process, deliver, and consume most of their own food. And all of that is organized and run and decided upon 
by the people, by the workers themselves. That's real democracy. That is a kind of democracy we do not have in the United States. And the U.S. wants to strangle that democracy just like it has been strangling democracy all over the world. <clears throat> and before I give up the mic, I just want to draw attention to one last thing, which is the legal case of Alex Saab, who uh, some people may have heard of before. Saab is a Venezuelan diplomat who has been eagerly, illegally kidnapped, extradited, and imprisoned by the United States for the crime of daring to feed his country. He traveled all over the world at the height of the sanctions, uh, securing supplies from places like Iran and Russia, food, medicine, fuel, in defiance of U.S. sanctions. And the U.S. is saying that he is not a real diplomat because the Venezuelan government is not recognized as legitimate by the United States, as if the U.S. is the one who can decide whether a country can elect its own leaders. Does that sound like democracy to you? No! And the movement to free Alex Saab is growing, but to be honest with you, we need to build it and build it fast, because Drake and I met with Camilla Saab, Alex Saab's wife, and what she told us about what is happening to him is very, very concerning. <clears throat> Alex, I didn't know this, he is a cancer survivor. And he has not seen a doctor for the entirety of the thousand plus days that he has been imprisoned. He has not been given adequate food, he has been physically and chemically tortured, he's missing teeth, he's been forced to take drugs that, that um, uh, rendered him totally sick, the prison would not tell him what was in those drugs. And as of three weeks ago, Camilla informed us he has begun to vomit blood. This man is a hero who is fighting for democracy in his country, standing up to the United States, and he is being slowly and painfully tortured to death for it. Free Alex Saab! Free Alex Saab! Free Alex Saab! Free Alex Saab! Thank you. I just want to let people know we are, actually Meredith can tell you about this. So if you want to hear more from Andrew's report, we were here when the world did not Blue Cincinnati for another attack. We were here when the world did not We won't sit back for another attack. We were here when the world did not